It has been my custom for most of my ministry that on the day of the annual meeting, I give the dean's report at the sermon time. So you'll get a little bit of a homily, and then you'll get the dean's report. And if you are visiting today, we're glad to have you, and you're welcome. <laughs> so settle in. <laughs> Almighty and everlasting God, you govern all things both in heaven and on earth. Mercifully hear the supplications of your people, and in our time grant us your peace through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. You govern all things, both in heaven and on earth. Lord, you govern. You have authority over all things, an authority which lifts us up to what is good and right and true. We hear two stories of authority today, that of Moses and that of Jesus. What we hear in Deuteronomy is Moses' farewell address to the Israelites before they pass into the land of Canaan. It is an ending of sorts for Moses, as he will not be the one to lead them into the promised land. Moses has certainly established his authority for the good of God's people, but now must step aside and let someone else lead the Israelites. For Jesus, it is a beginning, the start of his public ministry, and an ushering in of a new covenant with God's people that will last forever, binding us all together as a family. The Israelites are concerned about Moses' departure from them. Who will intercede for them with God? Who will be the mediator? Moses tells them that God will raise up a prophet from among God's people for them to listen to and to follow. The people do not want direct contact with God. They say that if they see the great fire or hear God's voice, they will die. Moses' words point us to the last prophet to come, the forerunner of the Messiah, John the Baptist, who then points to Christ. Moses' words are fulfilled in Jesus, the one who will establish authority over all for the good of God's people. Jesus, God as man, becomes the only mediator we need. He becomes one we can see and hear and touch and not die, but live. Jesus exercises authority for all time. In the context of where this story falls in Mark's gospel, Jesus has already established his authority over Satan in the desert. The disciples have already acknowledged his authority as they immediately left what they were doing and followed him. And now the unclean spirits recognize his authority as they know they must obey him for they have no power over God. Prophets have always had a reputation of going against established authority, often clashing with kings and rulers and leaders, and Jesus is no exception. Right from the start of his ministry, he ruffles the feathers of the religious leaders by speaking of God and God's kingdom without their consent. Jesus teaches in the synagogue, and the people are astounded, saying he speaks as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Jesus spoke without citing various spiritual leaders or authorities to back up his comments as the scribes would have. Jesus was the authority. And we begin to see the tension build up that will lead to Jesus' death, only to, to reveal his authority even over death in his resurrection. Jesus' authority differs from the scribes and other leaders as well because it is not exercised in a way to put others down. It is not lorded over them, but it is used to build up. Jesus' authority unites us, brings us together as a family joined in Christ as his body, the church. 
When we live together as a family, we go through many things together, both good and bad. We rejoice together in times of celebration, and we mourn together in times of sadness. We congratulate one another when we come together to do something good. We say thank you to those who are deserving of our deep gratitude. We are a family. In good times, we share much laughter and cheer. We can't wait to see everyone be together again. In tough times, we stand together so that we can be strong. We help one another in these times of need with words of encouragement and hands to hold. We pray together knowing that we will persevere and get through tough times, that we will always be there for one another no matter what. We are a family and we are grace and holy trinity. 2023 was a good year for us. We continue to be a strong parish. Our attendance continues to grow since coming back from COVID, and we continue to figure out how to build up Christ's church in this part of God's kingdom. We have much to be proud of, much to be thankful for, much to celebrate. But we also have some work to do to make this an even better place. We are a family. We work hard together. We face tough times together. We stay together because we love one another. That's what families do. We accomplished a great deal throughout 2023, including finishing our work on our new strategic plan, which you will hear more about at the annual meeting. And I am glad to share in our ongoing ministries with all of you. Our place as a cathedral is unique as our ministry is really expressed in two different ways. As the Cathedral Church of the Diocese, who hosts diocesan events and serves as a home for our bishop, and as a cathedral parish, serving the spiritual needs of our members. On one level, a close-knit family, and on another level, part of an extended family, and you will hear me reference both types of ministries as I report on the year. I will say more about this as I think it is helpful to understand how we function in both ways. In January, last January, we hosted the first diocesan ordination for the year, including, at the time, our own Brittany Sparrow Savage, ordained a deacon. Later that month, we held our first annual celebration of the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Also in January, I taught my first class in our partnership with the Center for Faith and Culture at William Jewell. My class that time was about sacred spaces. At the end of the month, we held our annual meeting, thanked our outgoing vestry members and welcomed those newly elected and set our vestry retreat for later in the year. February saw us again have our Shrove Sunday pancake breakfast on the last Sunday of Epiphany, and a new social event start with our Mardi Gras celebration on Shrove Tuesday. And about 40 of us gathered in the common room for a potluck of jambalaya and other festive dishes as we prepared for the start of Lent. And we will gather again this year in Hayden Hall in order to accommodate more people. We ended the month with our usual services on Ash Wednesday as we began a Holy Lent. In March, we held our annual vestry retreat and also several clergy staff and wardens traveled to Jacksonville, Florida for the Episcopal Parish Network Conference. We opened our arms again to our extended family in April as we hosted the Diocesan Chrism Mass on the Tuesday of Holy Week where the clergy of the diocese received holy oils for the year and renewed our ordination vows. Following Easter Sunday, we continued our now annual custom of a joint retreat with the cathedral staff and diocesan staff. This was followed by a wonderful fundraiser later that week for Pete's Garden. The community came together to literally get a taste of the food Pete's Garden rescues and distributes to those in need. This is yet another way we extend our family as the cathedral. 
Late in April, I traveled to the North American Deans Conference in Washington, D.C., hosted by the National Cathedral. It is great to gather with other deans and be reminded how we are not alone in our work as diocesan cathedrals and cathedral parish families. This year, our conference will go international as we will gather at Christ Church Cathedral in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. In May, we had our Youth Sunday. Many thanks to Claire and all who participated in that service. Then in June, we held more diocesan ordinations, this time seeing our own Robin Rusconi ordained to the diaconate. And we were honored to have Robin serve with us the next day before we had to say goodbye to her as she left to be the deacon at St. Paul's, Kansas City. Later, we said goodbye to Brittany as she too moved on to St. Paul's. Thank you to Robin and to Brittany for your time and hard work at the cathedral. We are grateful for your continued ministries in our larger family. Our parish picnic also took place in June on our second feast day, Trinity Sunday. The summer continued with, you guessed it, more diocesan ordinations where we saw Brittany ordained a priest this time. We hosted the picnic for the Northwest Metro Deanery and we saw the return of our summer music series. We also continued our tradition of holding parish breakfasts a few times between the 8 and 10.30 services. All were well attended, lively, and I look forward to having them again this summer. As the fall began, we saw the return of several cathedral events, our ministry fair, the Cathedral Cup Croquet Tournament, and classes in partnership with the Center for Faith and Culture at William Jewell. This time, my wife, Beth, joined with me as we presented Speaking the Truth in Love, Understanding and Acceptance of Transgender Children. It was well attended and a great class, and many thanks to our oldest child, Cyrus, for joining us and for being willing to answer questions. This past fall also saw our annual blessing of the animals on the Sunday nearest the Feast of St. Francis, our healing service on the Sunday closest to the Feast of St. Luke, our annual fall festival, our third annual hymn sing, diocesan convention, and the Kirken of the Tartans. We celebrated the anniversary of Deacon Barbara joining us, and we prepared to welcome Father James on the first Sunday of Advent. In December, we welcomed the Nativity Puppets once again, welcomed back the Messiah sing-along, enjoyed another City Come Again celebration with William Jewell College, and welcomed all who came to join with us to celebrate the Feast of the Nativity. Thank you especially to Claire and to other children and youth who participated once again in the Christmas pageant for the 5 p.m. Christmas Eve service. All said, 2023 was a good year for the cathedral. As we continue in our post-COVID recovery, we have seen attendance grow both in person and online. We continue to be good stewards of our budget, cutting back where we can, but also realizing we need the staff that we have to make sure this place runs efficiently and meets the needs of all who come to worship with us, pray with us, learn with us, and grow with us. Following the shutdown during COVID, we have worked hard forming contingency groups as we did back then and looking at ways to cut costs because we feared what everyone feared at that time that money would just dry up. We generated some good ideas and made adjustments accordingly to help. Giving stayed pretty constant, and we have all of you to thank for that. I greatly appreciate the wonderful support we received during that time. We also received help in other ways over the past couple years to ensure we could retain our staff and take care of the people who work here. We applied for and received a PPP loan, as well as employee retention credits. They have allowed us to stay strong and operate at normal levels. They have served their purpose. 
As we worked on the budget for 2024, we used the last of these funds to help balance the budget. Moving forward, looking to 2025 and beyond, we need to be more mindful of how we set the budget, fund the budget, and remain good stewards of endowment and overall finances. We are blessed to have an endowment, blessed to have had faithful people who over the years have given to the cathedral to support our work and ministry in this place for years to come. But we can't rely on this solely to cover operating expenses or it will quickly dry up. But we also can't be afraid of it. We can't just look at it and not touch it. It was given to us to use, but to use wisely and appropriately. That's why we have a finance committee, a budget committee, and a vestry, people who can understand all this and make informed decisions for the life of the cathedral. It is a true blessing, but as a parish in the diocese, we need to be able to raise our own money to fund our day-to-day -day operating costs. And how do we do that? We do that mostly through pledges from our members, from all of you. We also do that through plate offerings on Sundays and other feast days, through gifts, and through utilizing a monthly draw from the earnings of part of the endowment. In the past, we had taken a 5% draw, but we reduced that a couple years ago to 4% in order to lessen that burden. And we have kept it at 4% going forward in 2024. The question then becomes, how do we raise money? Well, here's where being a cathedral comes in. Some may think that because we have this role of being the cathedral of the diocese, we get money from the diocese to cover much of how we operate. And that is not true. As a parish of the diocese, we are assessed just like every other parish, and we pay our share, what is in effect our pledge to the diocese. Now, when we have diocesan events, yes, the diocese will help where they can on those things. But overall, it's up to us to cover how we operate this cathedral. That's how it works. We rely on the cathedral parish to support our own ministries. And we had an ambitious goal in 2023 to raise $500,000 in pledges. To date, we are short of that goal by about $44,000, though some money may still come in. We have set the same goal of $500,000 for 2024. And how do we get there? How do we increase pledging? Well, there are two ways. We can have everyone increase their pledge, and we will always welcome that, or by having more pledging units, that is, more people here to pledge. And how do you get more people to pledge? Create a place that welcomes more people in, who then want to make this their home and want to give to the work and ministry. This is where the strategic plan comes in. This plan includes ways to open ourselves up to truly be a place that both welcomes and serves the community we're in. It is not just the neighborhoods around us, but the whole metro community. Again, you'll hear more about this plan in a bit, but there are some exciting things that can be done to allow others to enjoy what we enjoy. Growing our music programs by restarting the children's choir and handbell choir is part of it holding community lectures and discussions on important topics that affect all of us, and not being afraid to tackle tough subjects and ask hard questions. This is what a cathedral should do. We will also start a new way of looking at the budget, setting the budget, and making sure it lines up with our mission and supports that mission. This starts with me, creating a vision for that process, and working with the vestry in order to give a clear and proper charge to the budget committee to do this. Our vestry retreat is set for February, where that work will begin. I am excited about this, about what we have set as our goals moving forward, and about what this place can continue to become. We are so blessed to be here, to be part of this loving community, and to serve in this place. Thank you 
for making it all possible and for all you will do to keep grace and Holy Trinity strong and relevant for years to come. Thank you especially to all who have helped, to the cathedral staff for your tireless work, to the wardens and vestry for your tireless work, and for being good stewards and caretakers of our facilities. Thank you to all ministry groups, the altar guild, choir, lay ministers, acolytes, lectors, ushers, greeters, live stream team, Eucharistic visitors, healing team, holy hands, funeral committee, and everyone for your work. To all committees, social outreach, budget, finance, stewardship, buildings and grounds, community engagement, security, communications, and any others. I appreciate your involvement so much. To all who facilitate and lead study groups and all who teach, to all who work with our children, youth, and young adults, thank you. To all who visit or attend whenever you're in town or attend online, near and far, thank you. You are all the people that make this place and these ministries work. Thank you for allowing me to be your dean and for letting me serve in this great cathedral. I look forward to all we will accomplish together in 2024 and all the ways we will continue to serve God's people from this place. Amen.